Please put your hands together and welcome our last speaker for today, <laughs> Professor Dame Sue Black, who will talk about how it's okay to be different. The Q&A session will be moderated by um, TBC. We're finding out who will be the moderator, but it doesn't matter because this is the time for Sue Black to take the stage. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. You're so very kind. I am so sorry for keeping you all waiting, but something happened in our itineraries where things got a little bit confused. But isn't that the wonderful unpredictability of life? And it's how you cope with those that is really important. Now, if we think we've got a predictable career, then how do we cope with the unpredictability? And that's what I'd really like to talk to you about today. We think that we know in our minds what our career is going to look like. And it's going to be stepped out for us pace by pace. But we have no idea of what's coming our way. And what I want to be able to share with you today is that not knowing is wonderful because that's where the magic and the excitement happens. That's when things can go wonderfully and gloriously wrong. And when they do fail, enjoy the failure because in that failure there is so much learning and there is so much more that we can achieve than when we just have nothing but success. And when you get to the advanced old age that I have, you get to the point where all anybody tells you is the list of things you did well and all the successes you had. And then when they put it in front of a young audience, they look at it and think, I can never do that. But what they didn't give you was the alternative CV. And every honest academic will tell you that there are two CVs in their life. The ones that are successes and the ones that are the failures. So up here, nobody would talk about the grants I didn't get, or the papers that got rejected, or the projects that didn't work, but it happens to everybody. And so I'm really just gonna take you through a little bit of my background in the hope that at the end of this, the message that you have is, it's okay not to be predictable. It's okay to be different. Now, I just have to put a little bit of a warning out because I am a forensic scientist. And so some of the things, some of the areas might be a little bit challenging for some. There's nothing in this that will cause you any offense. But some of the subject topics, because of what I do for a living, might just be a little bit more challenging. So when you get to old, isn't she cute? Come on, can't we have an aww? Come on. <sighs> It lets me catch my breath as well. You get to a point when you're old enough that you reach crossroads and you can turn around and you can look at where those crossroads were and you think, what was the decision I made at that time that has led me onto the path that I am? Because when you were that age, you had no idea where you were going to go. And isn't that marvelous? If we knew what was in our lives, how boring that would be. So not knowing what tomorrow brings, not knowing what 10 years bring, is a real opportunity. But we do get the opportunity to say, when we're older, to go back and look. It doesn't matter where you come from. What matters more than anything are the choices that you make, the people that you share your journey with, and decision to take opportunities or not. This is where I was brought up. This is a tiny little place on the west coast of Scotland called Strome. And it really was the most glorious childhood. I was brought up in that one in the middle with the green roof. There, were, there was no restrictions, no boundaries. Nobody expected you to ever achieve anything because it was just a glorious place to live. The west coast is sort of 50 years in history and in the past. We had two television channels. And they came on at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and they went off at 9 o'clock at night. That was the level of entertainment that we had. The nearest shop, and there was only one, was 15 miles away. So it's really remote, but it was a lovely place in which to grow up. And it was a tremendous opportunity of itself because it does give you a form of self-resilience. Now, this was my school. And the school was called Achmoor. And I'm a, a Gaelic speaker, which is a Scottish national language. And Achmoor just means a big field. 
and our playground was literally just the big field next door. There were only 14 pupils in my entire school. So it doesn't matter where you come from. It's where you go after that. But what really made a difference, and I, and I sort of stopped to think many times, how do you get into this path of forensic anthropology? And I blame my father. I loved my father. I adored my father. I was a little shadow that followed him everywhere, probably to his irritation more than anything. But my maiden name before I married was a good Scottish surname, which is called Gunn with two ends. And my father just happened to be a really good shot. And so when my father would go out shooting, I would go with him. Now, he only ever shot things for the pot. It was about rabbits, and it was about pigeons, and it was those sorts of things. But if he went out shooting, I went with him. And what I found was that my mother was a little bit squeamish. And so when we'd bring them back home, my mother wasn't going to do anything with them. So I'd sit at the back door with my father, and he would teach me how to skin a rabbit. And he'd teach me how to pluck a pheasant. And this is a really great Scottish word. He'd teach me how to grill a deer. And what that means is you pull the insides out. So at the age of five, I was up to my elbows in blood and dead animals and thought this was perfectly normal because that's what my dad did. And that's the rural nature. But for most children, it probably wasn't terribly normal. But then I don't know that my upbringing was because as Scottish Presbyterians, we have a really strong work ethic. And when I was 12 years old, my father said to me, what job are you going to get? And I thought he meant when I grew up. He didn't. He meant when I was 12. What job was I going to get? Because the, the ethos was that you need to work. There's no, no point in frivolity in life. Enjoying yourself is a waste of time in Scottish Presbyterianism. You need to work. And that barrier, that sort of bridge that goes between when you're 12 and 13, as you go into 13, you need to learn about work and you need to learn about work ethic. And so every Saturday and every holiday, I worked in a butcher shop. It made sense. It was like being at the back door with my father, stripping that rabbit down. And so I spent all of my teenage years up to my elbows, still in blood and bones and everything. And you know you're not going to be a squeamish person when what you look forward to more than anything is the lorry coming up from the abattoir on the day when that's carrying cow's livers. Because when they arrive, they have to be fresh. And in a butcher shop, it's always cold because there's fridges and freezers. Your hands are always freezing, but the livers were always warm. So we'd stick our hands into the boxes of livers to let the cow blood warm up our own hands. Then you know you're not going to be squeamish when it comes to things in life. My teacher then said to me, what are you going to do when you go to university? And I went, what's a university? Why on earth would you go to a university? What's the point on that? My parents expected me to leave school, to get a job, to get married, to have babies, and to live five minutes away from where they lived. But here was my teacher saying, you need to go to university. And I adored my biology teacher. He was just the most amazing teacher on the planet, and I'm still in touch with him. Such important people, your tutors and your teachers, because they can turn you into a subject, and they can turn you out of a subject as well. My chemistry teacher was appalling, absolutely awful. There was no way I was ever going to be a chemist, because it was totally, couldn't understand a single word of it, and I didn't like him, so I was never going to study it. I wasn't a very good student. I was always a middle ground student all the way through. But my biology teacher said, you're going to university. Because he said it, I thought, I have to go. At that time in the UK, there were grants. So you were given a grant or a scholarship to go to, to university. But it was based on your parents' income. So I lied to my parents. And I told them that I had a full grant because I thought at the age of 17, it wasn't their duty and their responsibility to fund me through university. So I took on three part-time jobs when I was at university to make sure I could pay all my bills. I did remind you about that work ethic that we have, which is a bit ridiculous in our family. And I wanted to get away from home. I loved my mother, but if I probably stayed much longer, there would have been an incident and things would not have gone well. So I knew I probably had to leave home, but I wasn't brave enough to go far away. 
So I went to Aberdeen University, which was an hour away. And I felt it was far enough away that my parents couldn't just appear on the doorstep without me knowing. But also if things went bad, I could get on a train and I could get home. So I wasn't really as adventurous as I thought. I didn't know what I was going to do, but because of my biology teacher, I thought it was going to be biology-based. It certainly wasn't going to be chemistry. And so I spent the first two years thinking, what am I doing here? What's the point? I did things like botany. I hate plants. I did things like genetics. I have never understood the importance of why people care that dead fruit flies have got rounded bottoms or pointed bottoms that had something to do with their genetics. It totally passed me by. And then I did soil science. I'm sorry, I was never going to dig holes for a living to be able to look at soils. So nothing that I did held my interest at all. And I started to doubt myself. I started to think I was in the wrong place. And at the end of second year, before you went into your third year, you had to decide what you were going to major on. And the only thing I had any good grades in, and they weren't great grades, they really weren't, but the only thing that was possible was botany. And the botanists were so dull. And I thought, I can't be a botanist for the rest of my life. You need to listen to what you don't want to do as much as finding out what it is you do want to do. And I went to the anatomists. And I said, what do you do in third year anatomy? And they said, you're given a human cadaver and you dissect that person from the top of their head to the bottom of their toes. And I thought, I can do that. Because <laughs> it's like the butcher shop. It's exactly the same principles. It's sharp implements and cutting through skin and muscle and bone. I can do that. I like the butcher shop. I like sitting outside the back door with my father skinning a rabbit. I can go into the dissecting room and do this. And you have the bravado before you go in. But once you step into that room, my goodness me, the weight of responsibility falls on your shoulders. And I love that as well. Those individuals who bequeathed their remains did so purely so that we could learn. And I've always said to my students, nobody will ever give you that gift again. Somebody who, left, who during their life signed a piece of paper that said, when I die, my remains go to these young people so that they can learn. There's a huge weight of responsibility lands on your shoulders to make sure that you do this properly. And we spent an entire year dissecting a single body. And you learn in anatomy that one year is not enough. It takes you at least 10 years before you even start to basically understand the form of anatomy. But then in fourth year, we had to do a project. And the project, I'm afraid, were in the worst possible thing for me. They were based on rodents. And I hate mice, and I hate rats, and I'm pathologically terrified of them. So people who were doing lead levels in rat brain and carcinoma in, in hamster pituitary, there is nothing on God's earth could make me lift a dead rodent out of a bucket. Give me a dead person. Give me a dead rabbit. Don't give me a dead mouse because I turn into a screaming girly and I hate them, absolutely hate them. So I said, what else can I do? And my supervisor said, we can look at human remains. We can look at identification of human remains. Oh, I can do that. That's dead people. I like dead people. Don't like dead rodents, but I like dead people. I can do that. And then whilst I was studying, what happened was a case came in to the department. And you have to understand, I am so old that these were the days before DNA was used in a forensic context. It was used in medicine, but it hadn't translated into the world of forensic science. And a young man's microlite was, was crashed off the east coast of Scotland, and the microlite in his body went into the sea. And the body wasn't washed up for a couple of weeks. And in the North Sea, decomposition is quite extensive by the time the body comes in. There'd been a lot of damage, whether the damage was about a passing ship or whether it was about rocks, but the head was, very little of the head was remaining and the hands were no longer there either because they slough off, they can fall off. And so we had a headless, handless torso. We didn't have DNA, but we couldn't see a face. We couldn't look at dental, we couldn't look at fingerprints. And the question from the police is, how do we tell 
whether the individual who has come on shore is the individual we think is missing. Could somebody from anatomy help? So I went over thinking, I can be at the back door, I can be in the butcher shop, I can be in the dissecting room. Can I be in a mortuary? Can I be in a place where the remains are very recent and the stakes are very high? And I found that I could. Again, I felt myself in a place that I was comfortable, that I thought I can make a difference here. What we identified on the young man, that he had a birthmark just below his left nipple. And we identified he was male, the age was appropriate, the height, everything else. But we had this identifier. And we spoke to his mother and we said, could you tell me, does your son did your son have a birthmark? And she said, no, my son was perfect. He had no mark. We asked his girlfriend. <laughs> and his girlfriend said, yes, he had a birthmark. And so it's always important. It taught us a really important lesson. Always know who you're asking the question of. The serious thing about that was that the mother then never accepted it was her son, even when the body was returned to her, because she needed to cling on to the hope that it wasn't her son, that he was still alive. And what that told me from that point forward was the responsibility that we had as forensic scientists wasn't just with the police. It wasn't just with the courtroom. It was with the vulnerability of families who had lost somebody really important to them. And there is nothing more humbling than being in a position of trust when a family are at their lowest point of grief and you're the one that is going to be able to help them. So my undergraduates and my postgraduate studies were done in Dundee, in um, Aberdeen University. But what does a forensic anthropologist do? Two words in there. Forensic comes from the Latin. Forensis means pertaining to the forum. The forum were the precursors of the courts of Rome. So anything with the word forensic in it doesn't mean you work for the police. It means you're an expert witness for the court and purely for the court. Doesn't matter which side of the court, but just for the court. And the anthropology is the study of the human or what remains of the human. And much of the time, if you watch those dreadful television programs called CSI something or another, which are about as far removed from reality as you can get, then you'll think that anthropologists just look at bones. But we don't. We look at the human in all stages. So individuals who are alive, as well as individuals who are no longer with us, whether the bodies are recent, whether they're fragmented, whether they are burnt, or whether they are simply skeletal remains. I'm probably pointing the wrong place. So I'm kind of traditional in a wonky sort of way by this point, in that I've gone through school, I've gone to university, you can relate to this, I've done the undergraduate degree, I've done the PhD, and I'm thinking, well, what do I do now? Exactly as my parents have said, what's the point of going to university? Don't you need to get a proper job? And so what I did was I stayed in academia. And my first teaching job was at St. Thomas's Hospital in London. My father, till the day he died, when he was 82, said, are you ever going to leave school? Because he was convinced that I'd never left the educational system, which is probably quite true, I have to say. So I went to St. Thomas's in London. But the problem is that once you're in London, then you're at the exposure of a number of agencies. And very quickly after I arrived there, I was given the first forensic case that was solely my responsibility. It was alleged that an individual had been murdered, that their body had been chopped into pieces, dismembered into pieces, and dropped around different bins around the city of London. All of those bins, of course, ultimately end up in a landfill site. And so the police were excavating a landfill site. Now, when you go through a landfill, you're going to find everything. You're going to find dead dogs, dead cats, people's takeaways, all sorts of things that will have bits of bone. So there was a vast volume of bone coming out of this investigation. And the pathologists were getting pretty bored with it at this point, and bones weren't really their, their forte anyway. So they said, can we send somebody down from anatomy? And so the girl, as I was called, got sent down from anatomy. And I was confronted by the singularly miserable police sergeant who looked me up and down as if to say, slip of a girl, what does she know? I want to deal with pathologists. I don't want to deal with scientists, for goodness me. 
certainly not a woman and certainly not a young woman. He had no confidence in me whatsoever. So what I did was I took that bone that you could see on the top and I put it into a plastic bag and I stuck that plastic bag on the radiator and I let it warm up because if it warms up, the smell gets really good. And so I opened the bag and I stuck it under his nose and I said, what can you smell? He said, well, it smells like roast lamb. I said, exactly, it's a sheep. And because he'd identified the bone, not me, he thought, oh, the girl's not that bad. And so every time a bit of bone kept coming in, he would say, no, I'll have that girl down from, from anatomy. And so he became quite comfortable with me. And that's how we got into the Metropolitan Police, I kid you not, through a sheep rib in a plastic bag. You never know where your life is going to go. Once you start working for the Metropolitan Police, of course, you're then at the mercy of other organizations. And very quickly, other government officers said, well, maybe these are services that we can use. You have to bear in mind at this time, there is no subject of forensic anthropology. It's not been taught in any university in the UK. There aren't experts in it. There isn't a, a, a professional body. We literally are people who are, who are parachuted in where somebody thinks we can make a difference. But the Foreign Office thought, well, every now and again, we've got cases where we could do with somebody that can help us in this identification. Are the remains animal or human? If they're human, how long have they been dead? If they're forensic, can we identify who they are? Are they male or female? Are they old? Are they young? Are they tall? Are they short? What's their ethnic background? Can we see their pathology? Can we see any trauma? And quickly, you started to see a change in the pathologists as well who realized there was an expertise that they didn't need to have. They had enough to do. And we were starting to be accepted into the team that works alongside the pathologist. Where the real game changer for me happened was here in 1999. I got a phone call one Wednesday from a pathologist who I knew very well who said, Suze, what are you doing on Saturday? And I thought, nice, he's inviting me to dinner. No, he wasn't. Pathologists don't do that. What he was saying was, if you're not doing anything, we've got some tickets for you at Bryce Norton, which is the RAF base. We're going to fly you out to Macedonia because we're looking at the war crimes investigations in Kosovo, and we've got a crime scene that I can't handle, and I think it needs to be you. And that crime scene is the one that you can see to the right. So that's an outhouse. And inside that outhouse, in February of 1999, 44 men were herded into that outhouse and they were separated into two rooms. A gunman stood at the door of each room and sprayed each room with Kalashnikov fire. Everybody was killed except one person because he got into the corner and everybody in front of him effectively took the bullets in front of him. What then happened was that they threw in straw in the windows, they threw in petrol and they torched the building. So the bodies are badly burnt. This man has to lie underneath the burning bodies of people who were his friends and his family. And he knows he can't come out because if he does, then he will be a target. Incredible bravery. He was the most important witness against Slobodan Milosevic when it came to the international criminal trials in The Hague. So our job is to turn up at this site now, you remember all those wonderful scenes of CSI where, you know, you have a sparkling stainless steel mortuary and all the latest tech you can imagine. Well, scrub it. So what you have is you have a field. You have a tent, but the tent is for the computers. It's not for you. You're doing the postmortems outside in the field on a bit of wood that's balanced between the top of a well and the back of a tractor. All of the bits of burnt clothing, you're hanging up on a washing line. You have no electricity. You have no running water. You have no facilities. When you're the only woman on the team, sometimes that can be challenging, especially when there is only one tree. And what I mean by that is gentlemen will often relieve themselves against a tree. Why you look for a tree, I have no idea, but you do. It's kind of difficult for ladies, can I just say, and you have to be practical about things. That's the whole point of what we are, incredibly practical people where nothing phases us and it simply can't. 
I did, however, have a moment when, being somewhere near the tree, I looked down and could see a little green thread. And as I followed that green thread up, I could see it went to an improvised explosive device. So can I say that really does allow you to stop midstream, because it's a bit scary. And we did have bomb disposal with us. But I called the bomb disposal out on a second occasion, which is when we were going through the scene that you can see behind you. Because they'd said to me, if you find anything that you're not comfortable with, just call it. And I was down on my hands and knees in the plastic Teletubby suits with the masks, double gloved, 38 degree heat. It isn't sexy. And I'm going through the human debris inch by inch. And I come across a piece of glittering metal. And I'm not brave. And I think, I don't know what it is. I'm going to call it. So I stand up and I call it. And so the bomb disposal guys put on all of their kit. They go down. They're down in that area for about an hour. And they come back out again and they take their kit off. And you know when somebody gets just a little bit too close to you, when they stand to you, it's uncomfortable. There is a comfortable distance between people. So this bomb disposal expert came into my, he invaded my zone and looked me in the eye. And he said to me, little lady, you will never know just how lucky you are to be alive. This is what you found, a soup spoon. So I had called the bomb squad out because the bit of metal I'd found was a spoon. Now, if your team accepts you, then you know that you're going to be ridiculed for the rest of that tour. So every time I pulled the covers down on my bed, I had a drawer of cutlery on my bed. Every time a bowl of soup arrived, it came with 14 spoons. And that's how you know you're part of the team. And it's how we cope. Because there's a lot of laughter, and I love to hear the laughter. It's our coping mechanism. Because what we do is so awful, and it's so serious. But we never, ever focus our humor on the victims, on the families, or on the situations. We do it to each other. And that's what forms part of the team. So Kosovo was a big turning point. We were there for two years, collecting evidence against Milosevic, Karadzic, Mladic, and all of the senior individuals who had murdered innocent individuals. And then the government sent me to Iraq. And sent me to Iraq in 2003 for a number of reasons. We had two soldiers who went off track and ended up being murdered and their bodies were not found. And we had a, a team of reporters who were not embedded with the military and they'd got caught in the crossfire between Iraqi troops and the American military. And our job was to try and find them. Please don't think the job is hugely exciting. The photograph that you see of me looking incredibly fetching in that outfit, I have to say, is in the middle of the biggest motorway that you can imagine. And what we've done is we stopped the traffic on either side. People are in 40 degree heat in their cars and they're being held back by this little woman down on her knees with a trowel trying to find little fragments of human bone. To say that tempers were running high would be an exceeding misunderstanding. Uh, mis mis uh, um, so that you never know where you're going to be and what you're going to do. And it plays havoc with your life because you get the phone call that says, we need you here. And I have young children and a husband and your entire life goes into disarray to be able to do this. But it's what you know you've trained yourself to do for as long as you can imagine. If it's not Iraq, then it was Thailand, following the Indian Ocean tsunami. And we came out here on New Year's Eve in 2004, going into 2005. And we were in Thailand for about a year on the identifications. So suddenly, a subject that nobody knew anything about was really at the core of a lot of foreign interventions and foreign retrievals, whether about crimes, war crimes, or whether about natural disasters. And now we see n significant numbers of international teams all assisting, and I'm watching my time. So then I got a phone call from a university. Now bear in mind, I'd left university to go and work for the government. I left university at St. Thomas's as a lecturer, hadn't had a single grant, 
had maybe written two papers, if I was lucky. And Dundee University phoned me and they said, we're looking for somebody who would supervise a PhD student. And I went, really? So you want me to come and supervise a PhD student and what, you're not going to pay me for it? And they went, well, it just so happens we're looking for an anatomist. I don't suppose you would know one. And I said, well, I do happen to know an anatomist. And they said, please come and talk to me. So I went to Dundee and I had a single person interview for the job of professor of anatomy and head of department. So I went from being a lecturer to a professor in 10 years without ever writing a paper, without ever applying for a single grant. That's unusual, but that's opportunity, and I'm an opportunist. You take it when it comes. And when they said to me, you can choose what you want to do to the department, well, that was just far too much fun. And I knew that if I was going to become anything credible as an academic, this was my chance. I'd been an academic, I'd gone away, and I'd got real-world experience, and I was coming back into the academic field, and I wanted to train young people to do what I didn't have the training to do, and we set up the courses. So if you look at my timeline, in 78, I went to university. In 82, I, got, I graduated and got married. By the time I was in 84, I'd had my first baby. Graduated from my PhD in 86, took up the lecturer post in 86, left government and le left academia in 92 to go to government. 95 thought it was a good idea to have a second baby. 96 thought it was an even better idea to have a third baby. And I'm so glad I did. They're the most marvelous girls in the world. But by 2003, I'm back in academia. And that's really challenging because you're an unknown in the field. And so you really have to make yourself known and you have to work and you have to work harder than anybody else. So they made me the professor of anatomy and forensic anthropology. They gave me um, the Center for Anatomy and Human Identification, which we built up to an award-winning center. And then there was a 10 million investment for a Levy Hume Research Center to disrupt forensic science. In that 17 years, between my babies and starting here, nothing really of any academic merit. But by the time I left Dundee, I'd written 14 textbooks. I'd written three popular books. I'd published 125 papers. I'd brought in for my department and through myself as well, honors, awards, and recommendations. And we secured over 24 million pounds of research funding. So from somebody with no academic credibility, taking the opportunities, being a bit of a chancer, being able to talk on your feet, not being phased by anything, when opportunities come, they're there for you to steal. By the time I'd been in Dundee 15 years, I had three marvelous women underneath me in the chain of management. And I woke up one morning and realized I was holding them back. And if I stayed at Dundee, they were not going to reach their potential or they were going to leave. And I didn't want them to do that. So I thought it's my time to move on. So one of the individuals, she took over the Levy Hume Research Center for Forensic Science. One of the individuals took over the Center for Anatomy and Human Identification. And the other individual, who's my wingman and always has been my wingman through Forensic World, she talk, took on the responsibility for forensic anthropology within the UK. And I thought, I need to do something different because I'm bored now. I've, I've had the grants, I've written the papers, had the PhD students, I've done the teaching. I need to do something else now because I've got a short attention span. And I thought, what will I do? I'll apply for a new job, something for which I am not in any way qualified whatsoever. And they won't give it to me anyway, but let's have a bit of fun seeing if I do. But I did have some quite good connections. I'd had some lovely students whilst I was teaching in Dundee. And I had a lot of government connections as well. So, you know, there's a little bit of a different side to me. And I took up the role of pro-vice-chancellor in Lancaster University, which is in the northwest of England. They hadn't had a pro-vice-chancellor for engagement before, so there was no job description. There were no objectives. Nobody really knew what they wanted me to do. Perfect. Because there's no guidelines, there's no rules. You can make it up as you go along. And that's what I like to do, so that I'm an opportunist who sees, how can I make this different? If I take on somebody else's role, then I find it quite difficult because you have to maintain it rather than create it anew. 
It was a marvellous opportunity at Lancaster. I had a four-year contract that could be renewed for another four years. But by the end of the four years, I realised I had to go. And I had to go because I brought in two very big projects to Lancaster. And as a university, I knew that it couldn't take on any more big projects. And I knew myself well enough by now that I would become bored very quickly if I couldn't go out and take on new projects. We brought an Eden project into Morecambe at £125 million. That's an environmental project looking at marine um, environment and changes. And then totally unexpected, absolutely out of left field, the um, five billion investment for the National Cyber Security Centre came into Lancashire. Everybody had expected it would go somewhere else and we stole it underneath the radar. And we did it because we came together as a team. This is the biggest thing that had ever happened to the university. And I knew that I couldn't keep bringing in these kind of projects because the university would fail. So I thought, well, what can I do next? Well, in between times, I allowed somebody to bully me. He is the most wonderfully glorious bully in the world, Lord Naram Patel. And he was the chancellor at Dundee University. And he said to me, we need scientists in government. And we need women scientists in governments. So can you, can you pop your CV in to the House of Lords? And I went, for goodness sake, get real. They're not going to let me into the House of Lords. So he said, well, you've got nothing to lose then, haven't you? Oh, naughty. So I put my CV in and the so-and-sos invited me into the House of Lords. This little girl, remember her? She could never have imagined for a moment that she'd be sitting in the House of Lords with a title, looking at legislation, understanding how government laws are made, and being there to represent science. It's a huge honor, but it's a huge responsibility. And I allowed myself to think it wouldn't happen. But when I left Lancaster, I thought, well, I need another job now, because I'm bored now. What can I do now? And I need to be closer to London, because I need to be in the House of Lords. And a job came up, and I thought, what does that do? Never heard of that before. And I showed it to my husband. He said, well, you've got nothing to lose. Where have we heard that before? You've got nothing to lose. And I said, well, they won't give me the job anyway, so I may as well have a go. And the job was the president of St. John's College in Oxford. And I thought, what does a president do? What the heck is an Oxford College anyway? And so I went for the job thinking, it's Oxford. They want pedigree. And I'm a mongrel with fleas, so they won't let me in. What a wonderful way to do an interview. Don't want the job. Because if you don't want it, you've got a much better chance, it would seem, of getting it. And so I went through the four interviews for the job. And the only thing that my fellows remember, and this is really important, is that um, in one part of it, they'd said to me, we want you to give a 15-minute presentation. And in that 15-minute presentation, we want you to tell us, what's your vision for the college? What are your top three priorities? What do you hope to have achieved after three years? And what's your legacy after 10? And I'm thinking, 10? You want me to stay somewhere for 10 years? No, I don't think that's going to happen. So I thought about it. And I said, well, first of all, how very surprised I was at an Oxford college that they'd set a piece of homework that had no appropriate answer, which I thought was a bit, a bit rude of me. But I thought, let's get their attention. I said, because if it's my vision, it won't work. If they're my priorities, it won't work. It has to be ours. It has to be teamwork. So I thought that, that was a, a good response to me. That's what they'd remember. That's not what they remembered. What they all remember is when I got to the point of saying, what are your top three priorities? The audiovisual system crashed. So they were horrified, absolutely horrified. But I have a smart mouth. And so what I turned around and said, well, obviously, my first priority is to buy you an AV system that works, <laughs> which was the first thing that I did at the college. And that's the only thing they remember about my interview. And that of itself is important because it says they saw somebody who could think on their feet, somebody who could turn something that they felt was a disaster into something that had a little bit of humor. And I just think for, for life lessons, that's incredibly important. It is an amazing college. It really is. What a privileged place it is. 
I don't think I'll do 10 years there, but you never know. So how do you get from Strome in the west coast of Scotland to being in the House of Lords, to holding honours from Her Majesty the Queen, and from sitting in an Oxford college? The answer is you'd be a bit of a chancer. You take opportunities when they arise. You don't regret, never ever regret decisions you've made because they're in the past and you can't change them. Just look at the, the opportunities that are in front of you and be brave. Be brave, take that chance because you never know where it's going to take you. And the one thing that I know from my profession more than anything is that your life can be short. We think we're going to live till we're in our 80s. Heaven forbid someone in this room might not make it to this evening. You might not wake up tomorrow morning. You don't know if it's you. If you knew your life was going to end tomorrow, would you go to work? No, of course you wouldn't. So why do we spend so much of our time at work? Do you think you get to the edge of your grave and say, gosh, I wish I'd spent more time in the office? No, you don't. Life is short. Life is precious. You need to do the things that make you want to get out of bed in the morning, that make your heart sing, that make your soul rise, because that's what living is about. Don't do a job that makes you feel dread at having to go in every day. You don't deserve that. You don't owe it to anybody whatsoever. You need to make your job and your life, your passion. I love talking to people, just in case you hadn't noticed. And the reason I'm here is because I was given the opportunity of doing the Ron Institution Christmas lectures last year. And I have to say, having done them, I share the experience with David Attenborough, who said it was the toughest gig he ever did. And it really is. I would never do it again. But what a marvelous experience we had. And what an, a privilege to be able to talk about science to people. That communication, which is the first panel that we talked about in day one here, was about communication. And that's the thing that we can do. If we can be enthusiastic about our world, we can enthuse other people. And we might not be the one that is fortunate to have the Nobel Prize, but maybe we can inspire and help the person next to us who is, because they are the ones who will make the real difference in the world. We mustn't focus on ourselves, we must focus on being a team. But if your work becomes your passion, then you'll never feel that you work a day in your life. This is just to remind you that CSI people may look sexy on television. This is the reality. Nobody looks good in those Teletubby suits, certainly not with mud half the way up the back of their legs and everything else. You're in a grave much of the time. You have to have humor, humor about yourself, humor about the situation. You have to have dignity and decency and respect. Life is short. And the best piece of advice I've ever been given, and my father would have approved, the people at the top don't work just harder or even much harder than everyone else. They work much, much harder. It is about hard work. It isn't about waiting for, for things to land on your lap. It is about being so enthusiastic and so positive about what you do that you want to get out of bed and you don't want to go to bed till you solve the problem because it's the most important thing to you. That, for me, is what the passion of science is about. And if there's anything to come out of what I've said in just the last little while, it is think about your life. Think about what it is that makes you happy, what makes you really unhappy. Why would you choose to be unhappy? Thank you. Oh, oh, oh. I thought I was finished. Obviously not. Oh, this one. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, what an inspiring oh, story. Nice. And uh, what you shared resonated a lot with me because when I was young, I was, my parents used us as child laborers. Yes. And, yep. <laughs> and I grew up cutting fish, filleting fish and all that because we make fish process product. And because of that, I ended up in the zoology department. <laughs> and one thing I shared common with you, other than being a child laborer, uh, was that 
I also did my PhD in the anatomy department in Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> but but I, I, I didn't do what you did. I was using the chick embryos as, yeah. as a model. Right, uh, I, I guess all of you are so inspired oh. uh, by her because I, I was watching from the back, from the front, I running in and out, and I could see the woo, wow in your faces. Uh, I now like to open this to any question that you may have uh, because we talk about science communication and you communicated brilliantly. And, and to be a, a Christmas lecture speaker it is indeed not easy because I am the CEO of the Science Centre. Like you, I never quite planned my path, different paths, different, different directions. Ended up, my role now is that, and we have hosted quite a few of the Christmas lectures in Singapore. It's not easy. Um, I may come to that uh, as a question, okay. but I can see people queuing up there. Um, and by the way, please feel free to ask anything. So it doesn't matter how silly it may sound to you. Anything you want to know, just feel free. Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll answer anything. Yep. Not necessarily truthfully, but I'll you, you are... <laughs> I, I saw you coming down first. So, oh, I see him? Okay. They are very yeah. civilized. They say okay, he, he then I, first. I okay, go come. first. I go first, okay? Right. I'm Liu from Malaysia. So growing up as an uh, Asian country, uh, family, we are growing up in a very harsh environment. All the toxicity... All the, all the negative traits you can imagine that falls on earth. So um, soon I will become a father, maybe in the 10 years' time. In your opinion, um, I'm an engineer background, so uh, how, how do we fabricate and optimize your babies or, ch or child to become somebody <laughs> useful in the society? And <laughs> Yeah, I use the word fabricate and optimize because I I'm an engineer. So... Uh, yeah, yeah. Question. Thank that you has for what good is mental health and also become a good individual. You know, Th thank you for a question that is yeah. so completely non-trivial <laughs> that, that we can probably talk about it for the next five hours. The most important job you will ever have in your life is being a parent. Yeah, yeah. And it's the worst job and it's the best job. And you don't know what these little characters are going to turn into. And your job is, is to guide them to the best that you can. And when they reach teenage years, they will tell you you did everything wrong. Because by the time they get to 13, they know everything and you know nothing. And then they go through that phase where they become the people that you instilled the values into. And they come out that dark side of puberty and become real human beings again. You just have to wait for it to happen. And I think it's about honesty more than anything. Um, with my girls, I never shied away from telling them what I did for a living. And so when I would go away, they didn't feel like I'd, I'd abandoned them. They knew mommy was going away to do some important work. And they also knew when mommy came back, what she would do is spend a lot of time with them. And so they got the benefits of it. I think they understand more than we give them credit for but it is about installing decency, dignity, respect for yourself and for others. And in that 10 years, which is a long time for when you're, you're planning when this is going to happen, you know, you can be practicing. So you can be practicing in terms of being nice to people who are around you. And I've always found there is this tendency to try and bring things to yourself and to hold it in and to keep people out because you're, you're trying to build your own career. I have always found the more you give, the more it comes back. And it really is about being a good human. And my goodness me, have you got your job cut out for you being a parent, but it's wonderful. Right. Uh, well, say, it well said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Absolutely. And it's amazing how an engineer think that 10 years is soon. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we biologists. <laughs> okay, I'll be never dead mind. in 10 years. Yes, yes. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. You are so welcome. Good afternoon, Professor. Good afternoon. So, um, thank you so much for your lectures this, uh, this afternoon because it was such an interesting story of how everything like, could turn out to be. You know, life is always full of surprises. And thank you so much for reinforcing this message. Okay. And uh, my main question um, is just, okay, so you just shared about your, the operations that you did in Iraq and in Kosovo. And would you like to tell us if there's any like, particular like, like mission that kind of like, stood out for you 
no, for any reason personal to you? So everyone stands out, and I know that sounds very trite for me to say, but everyone is about a specific event. So somebody has lost somebody that they care about. But probably the one that, that sticks out more than anything was in Kosovo. And it was a family who, who lived in the town, but they chose to go out into the village because they felt it was safer for the children to be up in the hills in a village. And they would come down into the town at weekends to do some food shopping. And dad would drive the tractor and the family would all be on the trailer. And on the trailer was his wife, her sister, their mother, and their eight children. And their eight children ranged from a baby of just a few months to two 14-year-old twin boys. A rocket-propelled grenade took out the trailer and killed everybody on that trailer. Dad was snipered. He was shot in the leg, and he managed to get down off the tractor. And he crawled away into the undergrowth because he knew if he stayed out and visible, he would be killed as well. But he knew his entire family was dead. What he then did under cover of darkness was he searched for all the parts of his family that he could. And what I mean by that, he only found one half of his wife. He only found the bottom half of his 12-year-old daughter. He knew he couldn't leave the bodies exposed. He had to bury them because the dogs would have used them as a food source. There was roaming packs of wild dogs. So he's snipered. It's under cover of darkness, and he digs a big hole and he places in that hole all the bits of his bodies, of his family that he can find. How you have the courage and the fortitude to do that, I don't know. What his biggest fear is, is because all of his family are in one place, his fear is that his God can't find them because he feels his God needs to have a grave for each individual member or God may overlook them and miss them. And that was a torment for him. So when we came along as the team, he said yes to us exhuming those remains. And those remains, when we lifted them, bearing in mind there were 12 people in there, um, 11 people in there, um, were enough to fill one and a half body bags. So we didn't have intact bodies at all. And a lot of time had passed, so they were badly decomposed. So what we did was we laid out 12 sheets on the mortuary floor, knowing that we wanted to find a bit of each of the 11 but we would always have a mass of material that we couldn't identify because it was mixed, it was commingled. And what it would be so easy to do is to just put a bit on each sheet and go, there you go, that's your son and that's your daughter. You can't do that. It's morally wrong. It's ethically wrong. It's illegal. And if the, the um, authorities come along and, and exhume that grave and what's in there is not what you say, then your credibility is shot. So we managed to find a little piece of everybody um, until we got to the twin 14-year-old boys. And DNA would never separate them because all we had was familial DNA. We had no photographs. There, there was nothing because the family had lost everything. And there's a real push on us to say, I can't give this man two bodies back without a name. We need to find it out. Now, we only had the shoulder area of the two boys, and one of them was wearing a Mickey Mouse vest. And what we said to the police was, go and ask dad which of his children, don't say which of the twin boys, which of his children would have Mickey Mouse clothing. And dad came back and named one of the, the, the twin boys. And he said he was mad about Mickey Mouse. Everything he had was Mickey Mouse. So we could tentatively separate those two individuals based on a Mickey Mouse vest. So we stood at the door of the mortuary and we were able to hand back a body bag and to be able to tell the father the name of the person who was in that bag with confidence. There was nothing else we could give him except that level of closure because he'd lost everything. And that teaches you something that's so important about life. It teaches you your family are the most important thing to you. I would go home at night and my girls would get a story, they'd get a cuddle. If they were really unlucky, I might sing to them, but they would at least know that mum was there. And I never cared if, if you know, the hoovering didn't get done or the car had a scratch on it. They don't matter. The people do. And it's those kind of experiences that I feel bring out the best and sometimes the worst in humanity. But I feel very, very privileged to have been able to be in the right place to help that man at that time.
it, it, it's, it's, it's so moving. It's so remarkable. I think I'm speechless. I, I don't know how to respond to that. But I think this speaks so powerfully of experts like you who would help beyond just science. Yeah. I, think, I think this is really a, a strong message for all of us. I think as scientists, as engineers, we must all remember that we are all human beings and every life deserves that love and respect. I agree. Thank you. It's like left wing, right wing, left wing, right wing. Okay, your turn. <laughs> right. Hi. Yeah, first let me thank you for that moving story you just said. Um, my name is Madeline. I'm from St. Hughes College, Oxford, just up the road, uh, where I currently study human sciences. And I felt like a theme that I kept hearing in your lectures is kind of like self-doubt, where you were just, you know, the woman, the one woman on the team, where you never expected to be offered a place in the House of Lords, etc. And I think it's easy coming from a place like Oxford or many other, probably all of the universities in this room or institutions, to face self-doubt and imposter syndrome, especially when you come from an unconventional background. So I was just wondering if you had any advice on how to tackle that situation. I'm probably the worst person to give <laughs> you advice because I, I'm, I completely believe that somewhere in my life coming, somebody's going to turn around and go, aha, you are a fraud. We always knew it. That imposter syndrome doesn't ever leave you. And I think what it does for me is it keeps my feet on the ground. I don't believe that I'll get the job. I don't believe I'll get the grant. I don't believe I'll get it. So when I do, it's, it's a wonderful surprise. But when I don't get it, it doesn't matter because I didn't think I was going to get it in the first place. <laughs> and, and I can't change that. So I, I don't think we should become so self-centered or aggressive or important that imposter syndrome is something negative. I think it can be something quite positive because it means we're human and we're real and we doubt ourselves. Anybody who doesn't have imposter syndrome is probably a sociopath. <laughs> yeah. So I would embrace it. But, but don't, don't do yourself down, I would also say. So when you do achieve something, and you've achieved it fairly and squarely on your own merit, then you need to be proud of it. And quite often I will, I will sit across from my students when, when we're, we're having what we call President's Collections, which is talking about their, their courses, and their tutors will say wonderful things about them. And I look at them and I'll say, now, do you believe what they've just said? And by and large, they feel really awkward. And I said, why are you feeling awkward? These are experts, they're telling you you're good. You don't have to become big-headed about it. You don't have to become self-important about it, but you do have to recognize that other people think you're good and you have the skills. Take it, bank it, and use it when you have those moments of doubt that other people think you are better than you think you are yourself. So I, would, I wouldn't lose the imposter syndrome. I like it. We have only two minutes and 44 oh, so seconds sorry. left. I talk too so much. I'm no, so no, 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 sorry. No, 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 not. I think, I think what you shared a, a very good... Uh, so the lesson is be the first one to join the queue in the future. Uh, I'll be quick. And be quick. Quick question, quick answer. Quick question and quick yeah. answer, right. So I find it very refreshing that you're do, essentially doing science in a very morbid environment. I'm curious about how you handle your own emotions because I'm sure most people will feel uncomfortable. I will, yeah. So I think I've become um, almost immunized against it in some ways over time because I've gradually gone from one thing into the other. But it was a police officer who gave me a really important piece of advice when I was doing some work on child sexual investigation cases. And he told me, don't do it. He said, but I know you'll do it anyway because you won't listen to me. And he said, but when you do it, don't own the guilt. You didn't cause this. You couldn't change it. Mm -hmm. Your job is as a scientist. You need to be impartial. Mm -hmm. You find the evidence, you recover the evidence, you analyze it, and you present it and you go home, and that's what we do. And I think that's, that's the most important bit. Be, be impartial, be a good, solid scientist. Don't become emotionally involved if you can avoid it. Thank you. I think we have one question left. Hello, Time. Professor Su. Right, right. Sorry. So as a like, forensic anthropologist, you have to work with several sectors, like lawyers and the government, and mainly is male hormones, like filled with male hormones. So how uh, would you might give us a little bit of tips how to like harmonize the situations among those like male hormones? So I have I have, <laughs> no offense, sorry. <laughs> I have never felt in any way treated differently 
um, by police or military because I'm a woman. They, they expect me to be a scientist, which, which has no gender to them whatsoever. It's just do your job. But I think there are times when we can do things that men can't. And I'm going to give you one example. We were in Kosovo and we had a French military gentleman who was responsible for our site security. And our head of our forensic team was an assistant chief constable. Both of those men had raging seas of testosterone hormones. They were alpha males off the scale, both of them, and they hated each other. And I arrived on scene and I saw the French military gentleman walk towards our police officer and I thought, oh, here we go. And he put out his hand to shake his hand. And I thought, good on him. He's actually made the effort. Unfortunately, our police officer then looked at his hand, went, I don't think so, and walked away. And I thought, well, that was helpful. Thank you very much indeed. How do I overcome this male um, sort of aggressiveness between these two groups? And I thought, well, I know how to do that. And so the French um, military gentleman came up to me. And this is totally inappropriate, but it's what you can do in the field. And he said, uh, he put his hand out to shake my hand. And I looked at it and I said, I don't think so. And you could see him think, oh, great, another Brit so stuck up that they won't take my hand. I said, I thought you were a Frenchman. He said, well, I am. I said, but I thought a Frenchman kissed a woman on both cheeks. And he melted. He completely melted. That gave me a relationship with the military that I could exclude the police officer. And then I had a relationship with the police officer that could exclude the military. But by the time we left Kosovo, those two men were sitting in a corner laughing and drinking beer together. So I think there are sometimes things that we can do that help to diffuse those situations. Well, thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. You notice that blinking non-stop? We have already passed that 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 time. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, you, you, you've done great. And, and uh, I'm sure some people may want to, want to catch you a little bit more no. to ask you. Um, yeah, it's such a privilege that I stayed back, moderated this session. And there's so much resonance with you. Um, I guess we are about the same vintage even, right? But never mind, I shall check on that. Uh, again, let us put our hands together to thank Dame Sue.